Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome back to part three of my lecture on chapter 12, Food Production and the Environment. Uh, we have about 20 slides left, uh, all right, uh, to go here uh, in this part three. Uh, so we uh, left off uh, with part two here, uh, beginning to talk about how can we produce food more sustainably. So obviously that's the key uh, as we go through uh, this, this next century uh, is how can we produce the food that obviously the increasing population on earth needs, but how can we do it uh, by off, uh, by also protecting uh, the environment and not degrading uh, the environment. So <clears throat> we can produce food more sustainably by using resources more efficiently, sharply decreasing the harmful environmental effects of industrialized food production. Again, we spoke about industrialized food production versus kind of the mom and pop, uh, old school agricultural uh, uh, a way to, uh, 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 the way to produce food. All right, so we wanna try to decrease the harmful effects that the industrialized food production produces. Uh, and we need to eliminate government subsidies that promote uh, such harmful impacts uh, that the uh, industrialized food production does. Does produce. So first thing we can do is conserve topsoil. So <clears throat> soil conservation is very important. And basically, there are ways to, to farm your land uh, and, actually, and also conserve soil. So these are some of, some of the ways that you can do it. Uh, we'll talk about them in a bit more detail. Terracing, something called contour planting, something called strip cropping uh, with a cover crop, uh, alley cropping or agroforestry, windbreaks or shelter belts, uh, conservative tillage farming is something else. Uh, and then you could also identify uh, erosion hotspots uh, and try to deal with them as well. So here are some of the examples that I wanted to go through to kind of show you uh, what these farming methods are all about. So you'll notice uh, up there, number A, oh, that number A, letter A, okay, up here, this is your terracing uh, type of farming. So you'll notice in terracing uh, farming, and actually if you uh, ever look back to the ancient Roman Romans, for instance, uh, on 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 a Mount Mount Vesuvius, all right, which is a volcano down there. Very uh, have a lot of good uh, good soil on those volcanoes. We spoke about that. Uh, this is how they actually farm. They had these terrace uh, up the uh, up up the volcano, uh, and that's actually how they did things. So you'll notice this is your terracing farming, and this helps uh, this helps conserve topsoil because you'll notice when it rains, you have these instead of having a slope. That would have caused the topsoil to run down the slope. You basically have these flat, terraced, uh, terraced areas, and, and and when something is flat, there's less of a chance of soil eroding because the rain falls on it and then infiltrates or percolates through the uh, through the ground, but doesn't necessarily run off down a hill. All right, so uh, so uh, terracing, uh, one way to uh, conserve topsoil. Uh, you'll notice B here. This is what's known as contour plowing, and you'll notice in contour plowing, you have you basically plow via the contours of the land, okay? So you don't just go up and down, up and down rows, you actually use the contour of the land to plow, uh, as, you'll, as you're seeing here, all right? They're actually uh, plowing with the contour of the land, and this also helps decrease erosion, decrease that, that, that le topsoil leaving, because again, it allows more flatter areas for the rain to just infiltrate the ground and not run off, uh, taking the topsoil with it. You'll notice C here, this is what's known as intercropping. Intercropping uh, is very important. It can help conserve topsoil. And basically in intercropping, you have rows of different crops side by side from one another, okay? So it's not all the same crop uh, all the way down. We have intercropping, which means you put different types of crops uh, in and around an air, uh, in and around a farm with some of the crops on the outside of the farm kind of acting as a little bit of a, of a, of a windbreak, a natural windbreak or something like that, or, or a natural way to, to keep soil from eroding. Maybe these plants, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, maybe these ones here have a deeper root system that allows the soil to hold in more. So by doing that, that intercropping, you can also conserve topsoil. And the last one here is the windbreaks. What are windbreaks? We're just kind of rows of trees or big bushes in between your farmland as wind because wind erodes topsoil just like water does okay as the wind blows through here it actually stops or the, the wind breaks buffer the wind uh, and that actually decreases the amount of topsoil uh, that is being eroded okay so again these are just different types of farming methods uh, that can help conserve topsoil uh, and these are the type of farming methods that we need to get back to again the ancient Romans did this this, 
up here. They did the terracing. Uh, most of our uh, most of our mom and pop type of uh, type of uh, uh, farms have intercropping just naturally. Uh, so again, and windbreaks kind of natural as well. So again, these are things that we can do uh, to help uh, to help conserve that topsoil. All right. So what can we do to restore soil fertility? So we can use organic fertilizer, meaning animal manure, green manure, or compost. Okay. Again, a compost uh, heap that uh, uh, I create in my yard, which got the soil uh, that you guys used for your soil analysis. Many of you did uh, for this uh, for this uh, week. Um, I can pull that out of a compost heap. So these are ways that you can uh, produce fertilizer organically. You can manufacture inorganic fertilizer like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, but again, we want to use that uh, as little as possible. Something called biochar is actually uh, something new. This is actually a, uh, it's a special type of charcoal uh, that can be used to help restore uh, soil fertility. And then crop rotation. And that's been done for thousands of years. Different crops use different nutrients more. Uh, so let's say crop A likes to use uh, more more nitrogen. Uh, crop B likes to use more, uh, you know, potassium in the soil. Uh, crop C maybe likes to use more phosphorus. So if you rotate the crops, all right, maybe uh, plant C used up a lot of the phosphorus in this soil. Well, if you move in a plant, a new plant next year, uh, that had that likes nitrogen instead of phosphorus or uses more nitrogen. Well, it'll use the nitrogen in that soil, allowing the phosphorus to kind of naturally uh, re replenish itself. And then you can continue to rotate the crops uh, year after year. And this is a way to uh, restore and to continue to have uh, that that soil fertility. And, and and crop rotation's been around for been around for thousands of years as well. All right. Also, we need to reduce that soil salinization and desertification. So what is desertification? That's when an area becomes a desert. What soil salinization? That's uh, remember when uh, you over irrigate and any salts that are left uh, that are in the water that you're irrigating. Eventually, there's so much accumulation of those salts uh, that you end up uh, destroying the soil and, and plants can't grow. Uh, so again, for soil salination, unfortunately, there's a lot of costly solutions. Uh, it's very difficult to get that salt out of your soil. So you really want to try to not have that happen uh, really in, in the uh at the onset. Uh, desertification, all right, reduce population growth, reduce, reduce the overgrazing, the deforestation, uh, and the destructive forms of planting, irrigation, and mining uh, that obviously uh, can produce uh, some of this desertification. We spoke about uh, some of this in this unit. We spoke about some of it in, in the previous chapter as well. And also plant trees that anchor topsoil, all right? Uh, we spoke about how trees, the root, tree, the root systems of trees, <clears throat> really good at, uh, at uh, preventing erosion and uh, keeping that topsoil where it is. So you can plant trees that can anchor that topsoil. Again, similar to the windbreak uh, farming method we saw uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so again, just these are some uh, ideas. Again, salt salinization, prevention, reduce your irrigation, use more efficient irrigation methods, or switch to salt tolerant crops, which actually can handle salt. So that's something we can do, maybe a genetically uh, breed crops that can handle more salt. Clean up unfortunately is very expensive with salt salinization. You have to flush the soil and it's expensive and it's inefficient. You can see flushing, all right, by kind of keeping uh, these pipes in here that would flush out the soil. Uh, you could stop growing crops for two to five years uh, on that particular soil, stop irrigating that soil. But unfortunately, uh, if you need your money and you need to create these crops two to five years, that may not be uh, that may not be uh, uh, possible. Uh, or you can install underground drainage systems that could potentially move away some of the excess uh, irrigation water uh, that then doesn't sit around and allow that salt uh, that salt to kind of kind of kind of build up. All right. So these are uh, some ways that we can uh, try to prevent and then try to clean up uh, that salt uh, uh, that that salinization. We can also produce and consume meat and dairy products more sustainably, all right? So now kind of moving on, remember we talked about crops, meat, and then fish, and we're kind of moving uh, along that as well. So how can we uh, consume meat and dairy more sustainably? Well, shift from less efficient forms of animal protein to more efficient. So for instance, pork and poultry are more efficient than beef. That means you get more calories per unit of, of a pork or poultry product as compared to beef products. So maybe we should be eating more pork and poultry uh, as composed to that red meat. Reduce uh, or eliminate your meat intake, all right? Obviously, uh, if you remember way back from the beginning of class when we looked at our carbon footprint, right? Uh, who are the ones who had the big carbon footprints like myself? 
we were the one, I were the one eating a lot of meat, right? I, I think uh, I think our I think a Lucia, our, our classmate Lucia, maybe had the lowest ecological footprint, and I believe uh, that's because she doesn't eat uh, a lot, if 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 any red meat. Uh, so again, that's kind of key here to your ecological footprint. All right, you want to reduce or, or eliminate the meat intake. You want to uh, insects, uh, another source of protein. So I know that sounds kind of disgusting, uh, but in other parts of the world, they eat insects and insects are, are, abund are, are abundant, right? So maybe that's another way to get our protein. Again, kind of disgusting. Hopefully you're not uh, watching this during your lunch break, uh, but uh, hey, I mean, it's it's another way to get protein, right? Uh, India's dairy industry use crops, uh, crop residues such as rice straw and corn stalks. Uh, this saves energy and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So again, just another way uh, to kind of do this. So this is a really interesting uh, chart here. All right, this is the amount of feed required to produce 1,000 calories uh, of uh, of meat, uh, and, and you'll notice that beef is so much more. 36,200 calories, okay, uh, is the amount of feed required to produce 1,000 calories of that meat. Look at pork, 11,000, 8,000 for poultry, 6,000 for eggs, a little bit, uh, just over 6,000, a little under 6,000 for dairy, okay? So as you can see, beef is far and away, okay, the most inefficient uh, form of protein uh, uh, for us to use because look how much feed is required. So that feed, that's like what you're feeding the animals. Third, three, 36, over 36,000 calories to produce 1,000 calories of meat for us to eat. Okay, so again, pork, you only uh, pork, 1,000 calories, only 11,000 calories of feed. Okay, so you can see how much more beef is compared to the rest uh, of the ways that you can uh, get your protein uh, via meat and meat and dairy. <laughs> Okay, moving on to uh, aquaculture, practice more sustainable aquaculture. So once again, aquaculture is kind of fish farming. So what we should do is develop an agricultural stewardship council, uh, which ha has developed some sustainability standards. Actually, they have created this uh, and they've certified only a little bit about four and a half percent of the world's ag aquaculture operations as, as sustainable. So uh, unfortunately, uh, over 95 percent aren't at this point. Uh, open ocean aquaculture uh, could be more sustainable than having it near the coast, okay, if you move it out into the open ocean, uh, recirculating aquaculture where water is continually recycled, and that poly aquaculture we talked about, not having just one fish uh, that you're growing, grow a, a number of different type of, of, of aquatic species together, uh, similar to poly agriculture, right, where you don't want to have one crop, just a bunch of different crops, same thing in, in the ocean, have a bunch of different uh, uh, or, or um, aquatic species uh, being farmed together, uh, and that will help uh, continue or increase or sustain that uh, that sustainability. All right. Uh, we can also expand organic agriculture. Again, this is kind of your mom and pop type of agriculture. Uh, some benefits of organic farming, build soil organic matter, reduces erosion and water pollution. Okay. Cause you're not, uh, you're not irrigating as much. You're not, you're, you're doing more polyculture and, and uh, terracing farming and things like that to reduce erosion. It loses, it uses less fossil fuel energy because we don't have those big equipment uh, that 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 is that it's farming, and also most of your organic agriculture is eaten locally, so you don't have uh, the carbon, uh, the fossil fuels, and the carbon. Uh, the next one, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, big haul truckers, uh, you know, trucks bringing that produce from one side of the country to the other side of the country. Uh, it matches conventional yield. So uh, what we're finding is that even though uh, we have all this high industrialized uh, type of uh, type of farming, that the organic agriculture basically matches matches those yields. Uh, they're more weed tolerant. Uh, crops compare favorably in, in years of drought, uh, and it's actually more profitable. So uh, for all these reasons, uh, expansion of organic agriculture uh, is probably a, a good thing. So <clears throat> how do we shift to more sustainable food production? Well, the components of sustainable agriculture, once again, rely more on organic polyculture, all right, less on your conventional monoculture. So again, polyculture, different types of, of, of crops uh, grown together, 
Monoculture is just wall-to-wall -wall wheat or wall-to-wall -wall soy soybean, okay? So you don't want that. You want more of that polyculture. You want to grow uh, perennial crops, right, that, that come back year after year. You want to rely more on renewable energy, maybe solar, maybe wind energy to help in your farms. You want to tailor fertilizers to different soil conditions to minimize runoff. And again, you want to irrigate more efficiently to try to uh, reduce those effects of that salinization, uh, which again, once, you're, uh, once you get salt, in your farm uh, two to five years it takes uh, for that salt uh, to go away. So again, just kind of a, a chart here, kind of help you kind of get the pros and the cons so you kind of can see this. All right, solutions to more sustainable food production. Uh, we want more high yield polyculture, more organic fertilizers, more biological pest control, right? More of that IPM, that integrated pest management we talked about. We want more efficient irrigation. We want those perennial crops, crop rotation, water efficient crops, soil conservation. We want to keep that topsoil uh, and we want to have subsidies uh, given for sustainable farming. What we want to see less of is soil erosion, soil salinization, less water pollution, less aquifer depletion. So all of this, okay, uh, we see need less of this, less overgrazing, less overfishing. All right, it produces less loss of biodiversity less fossil fuel use, less greenhouse gas emissions. And again, we want uh, uh, less subsidies for unsustainable farming, okay? So again, take a look at this, just understand what we want here. These are solutions, more of the stuff on the left side, less of the stuff on the right side uh, to help us uh, provide more sustainable food production. <clears throat> So what can you do? Uh, well, how can you sustain, uh, eat food and food uh, production more sustainably? Well, of course, we spoke about it. Eat less meat, no meat, or organically certified meat. Choose sustainably produced uh, herbivorous fish. Okay. Uh, use organic farming to grow some of your food. Buy certified organic food. Eat locally grown food. Compost your food waste and cut down your food waste as well. So these are ways that we can uh, shift to a more sustainable uh, uh, food production. Uh, practice more sustainable aquaculture, obviously. Protect the mangroves forests. Improve management of waste. Reduce escape of aquaculture species into the wild because that can uh, that can ruin up uh, that can uh, uh, wreck the balance the ecosystem balance uh, in an aquatic system. Set up self-sustaining poly agricultural systems that combine aquatic plants, fish, and shellfish. Again, similar to on land, you don't want one type of fish. You just you want to uh, you want poly. You want a bunch of different aquatic uh, uh, animals living together, organisms living together to increase or can keep that biodiversity, that sustainability, and certify sustainable forms of aquaculture uh, around the world. All right. So how can we improve a few a food security? I believe this is the last topic here. So again, food security is having people the ability to eat. Uh, government policies have controlled food prices and provided subsidies. So for instance, New Zealand and Brazil uh, have ended farm subsidies successfully. Uh, government and private programs that target poverty can improve food security. Low interest loans, immunizations, and, and vitamins for children uh, can help uh, food security, can help them uh, get the nutrition that uh, nu nutrition that they need, the, the vitamins, the minerals uh, that they need uh, so that we don't have any under, uh, under nutrition or malnutrition or, 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 or chronic malnutrition. Uh, community, uh, we can grow and buy more food locally, right, to cut food waste. So this can help uh, food security. Uh, community supported agriculture, people buy a share of a local, a local farmer's crop. So this is a, a way to do this. Uh, receive box of produce on a regular basis during the growing season. And this supports local economies uh, and local farm families. So that's one way that we can grow and buy more food locally to cut that food waste to increase uh, that food security. That's the idea here. Uh, much of our food waste occurs in restaurants, homes, and supermarkets. 30 to 40 percent of food supply thrown away each year, especially here in our uh, in our uh, you know our overdeveloped countries. Okay, so that's something to think about when you're not eating. Uh, you know, your mother or your grandmother always used to say, "Make sure you can't leave the table till you eat all that food on your plate." Well, this is why they were saying that because 30 to 40 percent uh, of the food supply uh, we actually throw throw away all year. So here's just an example of of a, of a community garden. Garden, um, where again, folks are, are just locally growing produce and then sharing it uh, with 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 the local community. Again, the food isn't being moved across country, so you're reducing the fossil fuel use for that. Uh, and again, you see a polyculture here: different types of plants all being grown together, different types of crops uh, all being uh, all being uh, uh, grown together.
All right. Uh, obviously, there are some trade-offs. There are some challenges uh, on the demand side. Here are some challenges uh, to food security. We got a growing population, uh, people moving up the food chain. Okay, and we have uh, we're turning food into biofuel now as well. So that's also uh, 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 decreasing. We haven't really talked a lot about that, but you know, a lot of your ethanol, ethanol alcohol, and that biofuel produced by grain. Um, now we're not using it for food; we're using it for fuel. So that's a little bit of, of an of an issue there uh, on, on, on the. Uh demand side. On the supply side, soil erosion is an issue, right? Depletion of aquifers. We spoke about that with too much irrigation, uh, stagnant grain yields. We haven't really seen why they did, uh, you know, 50 years ago increase dramatically. Recently, we haven't seen those grain yields continue to increase and rising temperature, you know, climate, uh, global warming also uh, producing some effects because a lot of these plants, a lot of these crops can't handle the rising temperatures and they're not being able to uh, evolve quick enough uh, to deal with the rising uh, rising global temperature. So here are some solutions on the demand size. Let's stabilize the population if we can. We spoke about that a, a, a couple of units ago. Eradicate poverty, reduce excessive meat consumption, and eliminate biofuel subsidies. Uh, we thought that we would help out these farms producing biofuel because we thought biofuel would be important, uh, but now we're realizing that it's kind of leading to uh, potential issues with food security for, because we're not having enough food. Now we're using it for biofuel, so maybe we need to uh, eliminate those subsidies uh, going down the road here. On the supply side, some solutions, conserve your soil, right? We talked about some of those farming methods, the, the tillage, uh, the, excuse me, the ter uh, terracing, the intercropping, the contour plowing. Use water more efficiently so you don't get that sound organization to occur, find ways to increase yields more naturally. And of course, if we could stabilize the climate, uh, a lot of these problems uh, might actually go away. So uh, last two slides here, just the big ideas uh, of this unit. I know it was long, but it's an important one. About 795 million people have health problems because they do not get enough food to eat. 2.1 billion people face health problems from eating too much, right? So we got the yin and the yang there. Modern industrial agriculture has a greater harmful impact on the environment than any other human activity. Think about that, guys. Modern industrial agriculture has a greater harmful impact on the environment than any other human activity. And you probably didn't know that because we don't talk about it that much, right? We talk about factories and cars and all that, uh, uh, and all that uh, way that, that we're degrading the environment. Well, your industrial ag uh, industrialized agriculture is doing it greater than anything else. Uh, more sustainable forms of food production, greatly reduced harmful environmental impacts of the industrialized food production system. So again, we do that food production more sustainably uh, and we greatly reduce the harmful impact. So final one here, final slide, tying it all together, growing power and sustainability, transition to a more sustainable food production, rely more on solar energy. Again, conserve that topsoil, return crop residues and animal waste right to the soil, okay, to, to, to re-nurture that soil, rely on a greater variety of crop and animal strains Again, that's more of that polyculture. And again, there you go. Use polyculture and integrated pest management to control your pests. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, Chapter 12, Food Production in the Environment. And as always, thanks for listening.